Okay, I'm now getting on to the final video, which actually presents the political economy analysis of gay households, which is the underpinning, the socio-economic underpinning of the rainbow movement. And it will explain why this can, movement can get the support of the state machine and companies. Historically, um, there's been a women's movement which challenged the socio-economic subordination of women within the domestic economy. And there's been a historic workers' movement which challenged the subordination of workers to capital. Then, over time, their aims were united in parties that aimed for the socialist transformation of society. What we have to ask is whether an analogous third movement of gay men can exist. What form of economic subordination would this oppose? What transformed economic relations would it seek? You can't answer that unless you first look at the current economic position. Once you start looking into the sociological studies, you'll find there's plenty of sociological data showing higher proportions of homosexuals are in the professional classes. Um, if you look at attributes like having a university degree in the UK, the ratio is 36 to 16. If it comes to having professional jobs, it's 9 to 5. If you look at the US, where it, the issue is having a college degree, the ratio is 43% to 27%. So, fairly consistent 2 to 1 ratio in these areas. Let's look at data from Sweden now. And this time we're going to look at incomes. And we'll look at couples. And we find that gay couples are were earning 584,000 krona. Lesbian couples were earning 464,000 krona and straight couples 532,000. Now, when you look at that, it's not at all surprising. The gay male couple has two male incomes and therefore it would be expected to have the highest total household income. It would be reasonable to expect the lesbian couple to have the lowest two women's incomes and the straight couples to be in between because of a mixture. But Gay couples typically have fewer dependent children. Lesbian couples do have dependent children, but typically they have less than straight couples. And when you think of it, um, it's not surprising really, because each woman in a lesbian household is unlikely to have as many children as a woman in a straight household, because otherwise you'd end up with an excessive number of children compared to the working population but it, the the fall off in um, number of child or in childbearing goes greater than that but lesbian couples do have children whereas very few gay couples do once you adjust for the per capita income that's to say if you divide the household income by the mean household size, you find that the tendency goes from gay couples have the most household income, then per capita, then lesbian couples, then straight couples. If we look at Britain, you find exactly the same uh, trend. In, If we look at pay rates, you see that 
gay men on average earn more than married men. Lesbians earn more than married women. Um, both of these groups have a higher activity rate, therefore that's to say a higher percentage of them are actually working. If you multiply the activity rate by the um, mean pay rate, you get the per couple pay rate. And if you scale that by family size, you get the same result as in Sweden, that the ratio goes gay couples, lesbian couples, straight couples. This is a consistent result. The, this relative order arises because, as I say before, gay couples only exceptionally have dependent children. If you don't believe this, check um, census data. Men are paid more than women. and graduates are paid more than non-graduates. These three factors combine to produce that result. Now, what these results show is that there's a two to one advantage in per capita income for gay as opposed to straight couples. Now, what does that amount to? If you combine it with the distribution of wages by deciles in Britain, you find that only the top 10% of straight couples are as well off as a mid-income gay couple, a median-income gay couple. What else does a two-to-one difference mean? Well, you can look at the wage share in Britain. This is the, the trend of the wage share. If we take the year in which that sample date, the, the survey data I've been quoting comes from, which is 2005, the wage share is 53%. If you have an income per capita equal to twice the average wage, then your living standard is not that of a family that is exploited. You're in the ranks of the non-exploited middle class. Because if we assume 50-50 division of value created between labour and capital. If you're twice the median, the main position, you're in a non-exploited position. That's to say, those who are receiving as much income as their labour creates, which is a precise definition of what it means to be middle class. You're not exploited, nor are you exploiting. But so far we've only been looking at paid labour. What about unpaid labour? What about the unpaid labour in the domestic economy? Let's take US data this time. And again, we have mean couples income. We have the mean family sizes taken from US census data. We get the per capita incomes. Same ordering as for Sweden and Britain consistent results. The, then look at the amount of unpaid social necessary labour time that's performed. And I've calculated this from using, in this case I'm, I'm applying the Canadian data for socially necessary labour time performed at home to the US since there isn't such detailed data for the US but I don't think that the ratios of hours worked at home between the US and Canada are going to be very different. If we then apply the US monetary equivalent of labour time, that is to say the amount of dollars created by an hour's labour for in 2007, we find that the amount of socially necessary labour time that was unpaid what it would be worth according to the monetary equivalent of labour time ranks this way 27,000 for the straight couple 2,300 for the gay couple note that this is more than the per capita income 
of a straight couple. The socially necessary labour time performed in the domestic economy is more than the per capita income earned as wage labourers. If we divide that, it, about 17,000 was performed by the mother and 10,000 by the father. From the standpoint of society as a whole, the gay couple were shirking their social labour to the tune of 27,000, which as I say is more than the per capita income of the average household. Now a, a US Liberal would say, but, but having children is a private decision, it's nobody else's business if a gay couple don't have children. Well. The Marxist response is that things can be simultaneously private and social. Commodity production, for example, rests on this duality. Commodities are produced by private individuals and firms, but they are produced to meet social needs. And children are produced as the result of private actions. But once they're grown up, they constitute the future of society and via their work support that society. A person who, due to either choice or circumstances, has no offspring, depends on the day-to-day -day existence on the offspring of others because we live in a society which operates on the basis of social labour. Labour which is social even if appropriation is private. It may appear, for example, that if a person says for their old age, they've provided for themselves. But this is an illusion. It's an illusion analogous to commodity fetishism, a monetary illusion. Because when any person is old, unless they're like my old great aunt going up the hills in her 70s to milk the cows, they're really dependent on the labour of the next generation. They don't produce their own food. They don't dig their own peat for fuel. Now this is a general point. It doesn't just apply to homosexual men. It applies to single people and to deliberately childless couples as well. In particular, it also applies to philandering men who abandon and don't support their children. So it's not a new problem. And historically it was addressed in the USSR and the other socialist countries. The groundbreaking points on this were the 1941 and 1944 Soviet family laws. The 1941 one came in just before the war. And then due to the war, there was a big demographic imbalance. An awful lot of men had been killed. There was a rise in the number of single mothers. So Khrushchev introduced measures during the war to combat the stigma against single, mo single mothers. Child support benefits were given to single mothers. There was a, a concerted attempt by the authorities to counter any stigma associated with single parenthood and there was social support introduced for child care. To deter philandering men from taking advantage of the new excess of women relative to men and simply not marrying, the bachelor's tax which had been introduced in 1941 on single and childless people was raised to help meet the cost of social childcare. And after the revolutions in, 18, in 1948, similar taxes were introduced in socialist states. The standard feature of socialist political economy that single people had to pay taxes to cover the socialised cost of childcare. If you were to apply that nowadays, 
you'd have to set it at the labour value equivalent to the average annual, annual hours that parents spend on unchild, unpaid childcare. For the US in 2005, this would have been 400 hours, roughly $13,000. And this would fall if more socialist, socialised childcare reduced the burden on mothers and fathers. And of course, you, the way to handle this in a social society is to have annual surveys of social time expenditure to determine how much time families actually spend on it. So what are the political conclusions we can draw from this? Basically, that the reason why the rainbow movement can get broad scale state support and encouragement is that its social basis is the middle class. Secondly, it's in no way a threat to capital. It doesn't cost anything. That's why it's funded by big capital and supported by the intelligence services. Now obviously socialist movements can use middle class support but they mustn't allow middle-class pressure groups to set policy or ideology. They mustn't be allowed to define progress in terms of their own special interests. And this is especially the case where the particular economic interests of these middle-class groups set them apart from the broad mass of the population. But the Rainbow Moon, of course, is not free from contradictions. You get contradictions in all movements. And it has a contradiction in it which is growing. And it arises from the point that I was making earlier about there being a quite distinct socio-economic position of gay male households compared to lesbian households. The rainbow movement is politically dominated by men and men are the dominant sex class in society and women are the subordinate or servile sex class. Within the rainbow movement lesbians have an objectively distinct interest from those of the males partly because they're in a different economic position and secondly because they are subject to ideological pressure threats of sexual violence etc. And as such, radical lesbians are the main ally of socialists within the rainbow movement. And it's in the strategic interests of socialism that the rainbow movement be ideologically defeated and split. And we should support any movement of lesbians which encourages it to split. Now, there's, some things should be so obvious, but in view of some comments that people have been making on the videos. The first point is that communists don't now advocate the criminalization of homosexual acts. The issue is one of political economy and has to be addressed by economic means. Now the attitude of socialist governments or socialist states to rainbow front political organizations is quite another matter. The MI6 and CIA openly advocate using these for political subversion. So it would be quite understandable if governments in China or North Korea prohibited such organisations as likely being likely to be CIA fronts.